And I have to admit, I'm really humbled to be up here in front of you all. I mean, I'm just like kind of nervous and stunned by you. And I'm, I really do mean that sincerely. I mean, um, I have a two year old and I'm really excited to see what he's going to be able to learn. These are the types of people that are going to teach him because it's so different than what I experienced myself. And this is where I'm completely going off script because it's what I wrote during the course of the day because I kind of had one of those very, very typical education experiences. Um, you know, my dad immigrated from India, so he went and got his PhD, and basically that was drilled into my head, and that's what I was going to go off and do, and that's what I did do. But, um, but it wasn't, it's, those are not actually the things that I actually remembered. I actually feel like I got saved from a pretty meaningless life in the sense of, um, <laughs> no, I mean, um, my advisor in graduate school was a tinker and a player, and so our my graduate degree, instead of being this long research endeavor that I did, ended up being basically my advisor and I meeting in the morning and said, huh, I wonder what happens if you did the following types of things. And I would basically tinker in the lab with combustion stuff, which means I got to burn stuff all afternoon long and blow things up every once in a while, um, including the exhaust root duct in the, in the building. But that was important because it was kind of the whole making process, which you know led to where my career went off to, which was a very different direction than where my father was which was the very typical engineer, worked at you know, a gas turbine company for 20 years and just a small little part of a huge, enormous machine is what he worked on. But for me, I, be, by virtue of that making experience, um, felt confident to be able to do crazy things. Um, you know, we did build a gas turbine engine from scratch using turbochargers and parts from a junkyard and so on and so forth. And if I'd gone through a typical process of education, I don't think I'd be you know, comfortable doing things like that. Um, and one other thing that kind of struck me, again, these will be random thoughts, so please take it with a grain of salt, um, is the comment that the chancellor said about don't be scared that you don't necessarily know the materials that you're teaching. Um, I lead a team of really crazy smart people, and they know stuff well beyond what I know. And I think that's okay. You're the facilitator, you're the mentor, and you want to walk them through the thought process at times, but not actually do the work for them and not necessarily be the expert. They can be the experts, that's actually okay. And in fact, the fact that you aren't proficient in necessarily what you're teaching them is a good thing because that means you are forced to basically keep your arms behind your back. So you can't actually do the work for them. So, um, so I think I wanted to make that comment as well. I'll go back to our regular scheduled program. Um, I did want to say something about my thoughts about making and I think, and this was talked about a little bit earlier as well, which is that it is human nature to make. I mean, ever since the dawn of civilization or dawn of humans, you know, it has been about using making to solve problems, to, you know, be able to hunt food, but also to express yourself. You know, cave paintings really started coming into light almost when tools started to come to light as well. And I think that basically shows this human nature to basically make and create, not only for purposes of something you need to do, but because of things you want to do. Um, and I even see that in my two-year-old, which is, Again, something that I wouldn't have realized probably up until recently, um, as I watched him grow, is he also makes himself. And I see such creativity in him, it's amazing. And to think that I probably had pieces of that when I was a kid that got driven out of me by the standard educational mechanism. Um, but you know, he'll, he'll look at the dishwasher when he basically opens it up, and he's like, oh, choo-choo. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And then he's looking at the track, and he says, oh, that's like a train track. I'm like, wow, that's actually kind of correct. That's amazing. And he took his little, he has this little tower thing that he uses where he stands on, he looks at and plays um, at the counter. And he basically took that, he dragged it to the middle of the kitchen, and then he took two square bar stools that we have near the kitchen while he dragged those next to the tower, and he said, that's my choo-choo train. And he literally knelt it. He climbed on top of it, he was the conductor, and he basically told mommy and daddy to go sit on top of the stools and basically, and he would take the tickets. And I was just blown away by that, because again, it's about creating, it's about making. And if a two-year-old can do it, I just think that we need to keep that energy going throughout their education. Um, and the reason being, in part, is because I actually feel strongly that making is what actually feeds these technological revolutions that we have. I love this quote um, from Thomas Carlyle. He was a um, philosopher in the 1800s, a Scottish philosopher, and it's a long one, but I'll still say it. You know, neither had Watt of the steam engine a heroic origin, any kindred with the princes of this world, the princes of this world were shooting their partridges while this man with blackened fingers and grim brow was searching out in his workshop the fire secret. And that's true. The first industrial revolution was made by these people who didn't come from a necessarily a formalized background, but rather actually sat and actually had the curiosity to try to invent and create things 
that were well beyond um, what they had originally thought. Um, and same was true in the second industrial revolution, if you think about it. The second industrial revolution being about um, electrification and about airplanes and manu mass manufacturing and so on and so forth. They were the Edisons, the Teslas, the Wright brothers of the world that actually created those worlds, not necessarily what you would think of ivory tower academics and the like. Um, third industrial revolution, I think that's the one that we're all familiar with, that we just lived through, um, computer age, um, information technology, obviously, you know, Dell, Hewlett and Packard, uh, Wozniak and Jobs, these were all companies that were built in the garages, that's what Silicon Valley was all about, and obviously that's there. And I think, you know, as we're going into the fourth industrial revolution, this is the one that we're in, we're starting piece now. This is about, you know, 50 billion connected devices, everything is going to be smart, everything's going to be connected, everything's going to be 3D printed, not everything, but a lot of things will be 3D printed. It's about, um, this world is going to basically be powered by the makers. Um, and these are really the skills and proficiencies that you're teaching your students about. That's what's going to make them successful. And what makes me really excited about the fourth industrial revolution and what making has turned into now, which I'm really excited about, is in the days of the first industrial revolution and the second, and even the third, um, the making was not necessarily accessible to everybody. It was very difficult to have a steel forge in order to try to really creep out, the, uh, to pull out the fire secret. But now, wow, we're actually making making accessible. So if you had a thousand people making and you had these amazing innovations in the first, second, and third industrial revolution, now think about the fact that you can have hundreds of thousands and millions of people literally making in the fourth industrial revolution. And that's gonna make that fourth industrial revolution just mind-bogglingly amazing. Um, let's see. I think this stuff is the stuff that just sounds stupid for me to say now, which is that it's a very natural way to learn. Um, but for us, and why is it that you know these technology companies, why do people like Intel really care about that? And that's because really that this is gonna be the stepping stones. Um, it's gonna be this fourth industrial revolution. It's going to be that kid that literally plays in his or her bedroom and tries things. That's gonna basically figure out, do things that I have never dreamed of because no offense, in a weird, crazy way, my innovative days are over, kind of, not really. But, um, but in reality, it's just, it, I have teams full of millennials and you know people in their early 20s, and it's amazing their thought process and what they think of. And my little boy looking at the dishwasher sees a train track. Um, in that same way, these these makers that we're actually educating are going to come up with ideas that are just beyond what we can actually comprehend. And it's incumbent upon us to give them not only the skills but also the tools to basically allow them to do their provision, um, to see their dreams come to life. So that's all that I wanted to say. That was probably shorter than 10 minutes because I don't ramble for too long. But um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone here. Because I think you guys are amazing.